Hi, I'm Max Kaiser. This is the Kaiser Report. I'm here in Ireland, Kilkenny, Ireland. There's a new song in Ireland. It goes like this. I'm looking over a 3.6 billion euro clover that I overlooked before. Yes, the new president and the new minister of finance people have discovered a 3.6 billion euro hole in the accounting budget that they didn't see before. Such is the way things are going here in Ireland. Stacey Herbert. Yes, Max, it's yeah. the luck of the Irish. Speaking of the Irish, we're going to read the Irish Times here. 3.8 billion euros in cuts and tax increases coming in budget. Michael Noonan, the finance minister, says EU IMF bailout condition sacrosanct. Well, you would think the two would match up. You know, I just talking about a $3.6 billion magical leprechaun-like find by the new president. Uh, and this $3.8 billion requirement of cuts, you'd think they would match up. But of course, in this world of economics we live in, all the benefits accrue to all the same crux, and all the austerity has to be borne by the general population. The word that I'm looking at here, Max, is sacrosanct, because it's a word that we see over and over when it applies to any bankers' bonuses, or their contracts, or their various derivatives that they write. So I looked it up online. Sacrosanct means regarded as too important or valuable to be interfered with, immune from criticism or violation, and treated as if holy. Yeah. Uh, well, that's the trick, isn't it? The, the bankers have become the new clergy in this globalized, financialized world. So while the Vatican is suffering catastrophic moral collapse here in Ireland, with Ireland canceling and closing their embassies in the Vatican, uh, at the same time, they're giving birth to a new papacy of investment bankers who believe they walk on water and go unchallenged through the land, bestowing their indulgences for a small fee, of course. Well, of course, in Ireland, it would be now the Fed, the Treasury, and the Holy Troika. The Fed, the Treasury, and the Holy Troika. I like that. <laughs> so we're going to look at one of the elements of this budget is that they're making a a 750 million euro cut from the capital investment account for the nation. But at the same time this week, they paid off 750 million euro in unsecured Anglo-Irish bonds. Right. The word unsecured, I think, needs to be highlighted there. That means that the uh, issuer was taking a risk fully in the knowledge that there is a strong possibility they won't get paid back. This is what unsecured means. So the fact that the Irish government is deciding to pay this loan anyway uh, shows you the what I would have to call Stockholm Syndrome. They've fallen in love with their captors, haven't they? And they believe that they, well, just give you all of our money, even though you don't in any way legally, uh, there's any real statute that would require us to give you this money. We're going to give it to you anyway, while simultaneously cutting the very funds you would need to grow your economy. So they're not going to pay this debt going forward because they're cutting the very source of future GDP growth. This is the very definition of insanity, uh, played out brilliantly here at the Kilconomics Festival. We're hearing all about how this is all being done from a whole panel of economists who are going into great detail as to why the sudden emergence of a fiscal and monetary papacy is destroying Europe in place of the Vatican that's now been completely discredited. So we move from the Fed, the Treasury, and the holy bondholders to some miracles that are actually being created. We talked about one where they found this 3.6 billion euros. But over in the U.S., we have this headline, MF client funds said to be located at J.P. Morgan. Yes, they miraculously found those missing funds in J.P. Morgan. <laughs> yes, whether it's uh, uh, b fishes and loaves feeding the masses or turning water into wine, you can always rely on Jamie Dimon to come up with the goods in a miraculous discovery of $750 million that was uh, hiding under the desk somewhere. I know I put that billion dollars here somewhere. Somebody get Blythe Masters on the phone. She must know where that billion dollars is. Well, they actually found $2.2 billion, they said. Well, it's the immaculate deception, isn't it? With yeah. Blythe Masters is basically the new uh, virgin birth of derivatives that are created without actual any, any financial insemination. It's uh, merely a child being born from the loins of a credit default swap. Yes, Blythe Masters, the Virgin Mary. 
I see this also made it to the headlines here. Head of MF Global resigns in wake of bankruptcy filing. I, I, I'm sure they gave him a huge golden parachute as a thank you for destroying that particular firm. This is Corzine, former head of Goldman Sachs, one of the 12 apostles of the new uh, apocalypse. I'm sure he's gone to a better place in the uh, banking heaven skies. Oh, yes. <laughs> I believe the Pope is going to beautify him. He'll be St. Corzine very soon. Beauti beautify him? He's going to the beauty parlor. To be, to be beautified by the Pope. Well, this is the thing about the Vatican. They've not, they need to rebrand themselves. Because all the old terminology, nobody even can get, get behind anymore. <laughs> so, He's going to have his old new do. He's going to have a no, you know, makeup, makeover. He's going to be beautified, turned into a saint. Saint Corzine. <laughs> well, I like how... The guy commits a crime. A again, another sacrosanct element of the futures market is, of course, that you don't commingle funds. He broke that. And for that, he says he will not seek his $12 million severance. That is sacrosanct in the contract. He's not going to seek it. He's going to, it's his charity. He's going to give back to the community well, for I which he stole. <laughs> I attribute this to the Occupy Wall Street movement, where these guys are saying, well, we won't take the bonuses, because they realize that the next step after that is a pitchfork up the shrink shrink, as we say on this show. <laughs> well, speaking of Occupy Wall Street, we're going to move over to some of the martyrs of this financial, new financial trinity, this holy troika we have now. And this is a, a little clip from Mayor Bloomberg of New York, and he was asked what he thought of the Occupy Wall Street protesters. I hear your complaints, some of them totally unfounded. It was not the banks that created the mortgage crisis. It was plain and simple Congress who forced everybody to go and to give mortgages to people who were on the cusp. He's picking sides, and I think everyone needs to pick a side. Uh, this growing conflict between the top 1% and everyone else, and uh, you take a risk. I mean, this is, we're bringing risk back to capitalism. It's the risk of being impaled. But he's also pointing out that we should be beautifying Angelo Mazzillo. He's the martyr of this subprime crisis because, look, the guy was forced to leave with only a $285 million payout. And after being brutally repressed by the government that he was forced to give all of these loans to all these poor schmucks out there, and all he received was $285 million in payout. What do you think of this, Max? Okay, so you're talking about the uh, former head of Countrywide. Countrywide. Which, of course, was bought up by uh, Merrill Lynch, I suppose, which got bought up by um, Bank of America, which will be soon bought up by J.P. Morgan. And the, the problem is too big to fail, but don't look under behind the curtain. Uh, things get bigger. Uh, and so uh, this Mozilla character, he, of course, was caught red-handed falsifying documents and committing forgery, of course, uh, documents, and uh, giving loans to muskrats who were living in tree stumps half a million at a time, uh, and calling that a uh, legitimate uh, loan made and getting huge fees as a result. And then when that went bust, they got a huge payout uh, from the government, of course, that's run by crony friends of Mozilla who uh, are occupying all the regulatory authorities. Sure, there were the friends of Angelo Mozilla, were the famous, like Christopher Dodd included, you know, they were Congress people and senators who received special interest rates on loans from Mozilla. That's right, he made fraudulent loans, made gazillions of dollars, and gave it to politicians to help them re-elect themselves, and uh, he's off there sunning himself on a yacht, laughing his tuki tuki off. Who are some of the other martyrs, though, of this subprime crisis? Would Dick Fold be a martyr? Well, Dick Fold, he himself, I'm sure, considers himself to be a martyr. He still doesn't understand yet. Or Jim, Jimmy Kane, uh, over there at Bear Stearns, uh, he's a martyr uh, of this horrible, um, to put it in biblical terms, there was a flood of credibility that came and destroyed the miracle workers as they were turning essentially what you could call dog poop into securitized mortgage-backed securities traded amongst the major banks around the world. It's called transubstantiation. <laughs> That's exactly right, Stacey Herbert. Transubstantiation is exactly the term. This is, in other words, at the Eucharist, it's not the figmentation of the 
bone and blood of Christ. This is the actual bone and blood of Christ during the Eucharist. That's the concept of transubstantiation. So you're saying you're applying that to the subprime mortgage market. Mm -hmm. And by resecuritizing what is essentially dog poop and having Moody's give it a triple A rated credit, it becomes godlike. <laughs> exactly. It becomes worth something. It, it delivers you to the American dream, it was often called. That was the heaven, was the American dream. Yeah, before America went bankrupt, they had this idea. Speaking of transubstantiation, I have another headline here, and you mentioned this on your first evening here, you're at the Kilconomics Festival, you talked about where you would see the fraud happen, and it happens via the IPO market. Groupon's value soars on first day of trading. Controversial coupon seller now worth nearly $18 billion. The shares popped 30% on the first day. Tell us about it. Well, as I said, there would be this huge, I think I said 30 to 40% pop on the first day. And sure enough, this is exactly what happened. Now, this is, first of all, Groupon is a Ponzi scheme. All their original customers are canceling out because they don't make any money off taking advantage of what Groupon offers, which are discounts to the point of you're losing massive amounts of money. So uh, all the original customers are not re-signing up. So they need new suckers to come into Groupon. That's the very definition of a Ponzi scheme. So now this is an $18 billion Ponzi scheme. But when it was taken public, of course, the first day pop is critical. And this is engineered by offering a very few number of shares and that all in the aftermarket, the banks who underwrite this offering are buying in the aftermarket, which is technically illegal, but it's something called laddering and they do it anyway. So laddering of IPOs means that you can engineer a price appreciation. There's very little stock in the float. You can't sell it short because all the stock's held by the underwriters. And what you do with that pop, of course, is you pay off all the litigants in your lawsuits. So all the law people are suing the underwriters. Maybe it's Goldman Sachs or JP Morgan, anyone who's got a lawsuit pending. They use the IPO stock as payment, as hush money to pay them off. They use it to take care of any errors in their error account, which they've accumulated by doing illicit, illegal deals over the years, and they churn that a few uh, times. And uh, they use it basically as uh, a currency to uh, favor political curry, because of course in Washington, amongst lobbyists, insider trading is, is legal, yeah. and they use it to get um, help their campaign to deregulate markets so they can further perpetuate their fraud and embezzlement of the markets and the American and global citizens through outright manipulation and fraud. And welcome Groupon, the biggest fraud of the week. Yeah, well, that's the interesting thing about this is that unlike a lot of the last wave of crime, banking crime, like the subprime crime, is that almost all of the financial media <laughs> was saying openly that this is a Ponzi scheme, it's don't invest in this, but it's still at pop 30%. Right, it just goes to show you that the, the business of America, fraud on Wall Street, is still alive and kicking and uh, despite all the macroeconomic events that are plaguing the rest of the world. Well, Stacy, thanks so much for being once again on the Kaiser Report. Thank you, Max. Don't go away. Much more coming your way, so stay right there. From Los Angeles to Chicago to Birmingham, 20 trauma centers have closed since 2000. The problem is not enough inpatient beds, not enough emergency department beds, and not enough nurses to man those beds to take care of all the people who need our care. The only real health care system that we have in the city of Los Angeles is the Los Angeles Fire Department. In fact, when I started my venture as a firefighter, I didn't want to do EMS. I started out wanting to just do firefighting. It's about 82% of what we do in the fire department is medical. I've had a rescue uh, a couple weeks ago, waited four hours for a bed. I've waited sometimes three hours. I was at St. Francis in Linwood for four hours and 15 minutes standing against the wall with a patient. We have a federal law that mandates that you can turn no one away who seeks care in an emergency room. We have the most expensive health care system in the world, and it's probably valued the least.
Hi, I'm Max Kaiser. This is the Kaiser Report. I'm at the Kilkenomics Festival in Kilkenny, Ireland, and we're about to speak with Konstantin Gurdjieff. He is the adjunct lecturer in finance with Trinity College Dublin and holds a number of other senior research positions with international companies and organizers. He was also mentioned in today's Irish Times as one of the new breed of economic rock stars. Um, Constantine, welcome to Thank the you. Kaiser Report. Thank you, Max. Good to be here. <laughs> All right. Um, let's talk about this Anglo Irish deal. This is the, really the talk of the conference so far. So give us some more background on this and some of the numbers and what's going forward. Well, the background is really the Anglo Irish Bank epitomizes the destruction of the proper banking, conservative banking system around the world. It's probably the most reckless lender that we had in the advanced economies during the, the latest boom which predated uh, the current crisis. It was the bank which was known as the uh, parking lot bank because that's the amount of time it took them to approve multi-million euro loan. By the time the salesperson leaves the client, the loan would be approved by the time the salesperson gets into the car. How, let me just cut in here. How did all the risk uh, you know, measures get abandoned? How, how did that, what, what, what was their technique there? How did they simply not be able to apply any risk analysis whatsoever? Well, like the rest of the banks, they didn't have to do much of the risk analysis because liquidity of funding was very cheap. So as a result of it, whatever you lose in the market, you can make back in terms of the higher margins, in terms of the appreciation on the asset base, which is a typical, classical, if you want, asset bubble. So in some ways, if you think about it, not just anglo Irish Bank, they were just more extreme case, but the entire banking system in Europe and in the United States operated like kind of like a fire engine. It was hosing out, hoovering out the cheap liquidity and then spreading it in a very kind of, you know, indiscriminate way across the economy in the hope that some loans will pay back and some loans will go up. Okay, really but up. That, that cheap money goes out there to feed speculation in real estate and that real estate is used as collateral to perpetuate more loans. And so this is the, the ecosystem, if you will, of how things got completely out of hand because it became a self-fulfilling prophecy. As long as they kept making these cheap loans, the asset prices had to go up until such time as you had a classic blow-off. Exactly, and the blow-off was also preconditioned by the fact that there were systems, regulatory systems and supervisory systems, both in Europe and in particular in Ireland, but also in the United States, which have diverted the efforts, or if you want, the pressure, which is building up in the system itself by creation of those artificial assets and artificial, if you want, increases in asset valuations and also the, if you want, mispricing of liabilities risks and maturity risks and other risks within the system. All of that was diverted by the regulatory system into, if you want, kind of concentrated allocation of the risk into one particular class of sub-assets. In the case of the United States, that was the class of, for example, the derivative instruments. In the, case of the, uh, in the case of Ireland, it was the class of assets which related to the property development and property investment and things like that. So not only the risk was growing, on the books, on the balance sheets of the banks, and it was unchecked and unpriced, but it was also diverted. What we're seeing in Greece today right now, in part, is an outcome of the poor regulatory environment for the global banking system, which has treated the government bonds of insolvent governments, and we knew that Greece was insolvent for a decade plus, without even, without discovering what we have learned since then about the deeper rates of insolvency, such as the Goldman Sachs deals that they have done to, to hide parts of their deficits and parts of their debt as well. But even apart from that, we knew that it was deeply insolvent solvent. All you need to look is a current account. Greece has not been solvent in the last 20 years for more than just one year probably out of it. Ireland, by the way, in the last 10 years has only been solvent for one year in terms of the current account surpluses. And this is what was going on. The governments were continuously using the banking system to borrow from the markets, through the, uh, through the banks as well, and as a result of it, they encouraged the banks to accumulate the liabilities of the state on their asset side. So the risk not only got was rising and was unpriced, but it also got compounded by the fact that that risk was placed into, if you want, the box of capital. It was treated as if there is no risk at the same time as the risk was rising. Okay, it's, it sounds to me as if you could buy uh, insurance on car accidents, let's say. Let's say it's a Formula One high-speed car race, and you're buying insurance on a driver, but you're dividing up that insurance into the um, racing around the track, approaching the wall, getting closer to the wall, and then actually crashing into the wall. And then pricing each one of these differently, and then saying the actual crash into the wall itself, where the actual crash happens, this, in fact, we're not even going to count in the overall matrix of risk. And as a matter of fact, we're just going to ignore that bit, and we're going to trade the other bits approaching the crash separately. 
Exactly. That's a, exactly what was happening in, a co in kind of a context of what we call black, black swan events, very much extreme events at the tail of the probability distribution. So they force all the risk into extreme events exactly. that they say statistically can't happen. That's right. And they price everything else as if there's not going to be an extreme event, which keeps capital cheap, which keeps asset pricing rises. Well, what's rising. happening in the regulatory slash financial system around the world is that, in effect, we were playing Russian roulette, and after every round, we were loading new bullets into the barrel. So sooner or later, we've had the entire barrel loaded. There was no pro the probability of blowing your brains out in this current environment was 100% by the end of the game. And this right. is exactly what happened. Well, this is important to, to note, that the, the chances of this catastrophe happening were 100%. Oh, absolutely true. The difficulty, of course, it's different from knowing ex post after the fact that it, will, it had to happen at 100% probability and knowing at the time because the game was so big and the game was moving so fast that the banks like Anglo-Irish banks were moving very fast up the ranks. Remember that back in 2006, if I believe correctly, the uh, Davis Summit in Switzerland, uh, the, Glo the World Economic Forum Summit, actually voted Anglo-Irish Bank as the best bank in the world. And the, all of that was predicated solely on one line of the profitability. The okay, when you say they're moving up the ranks, you're talking about they're moving up the ranks in terms of their ability to lay off these bad derivative bets on the global market at exchange rates and derivative rates and rates of exchange that are feeding into their bottom line because their cost of capital is essentially negative, isn't it? That's right. They now, how, first of all, explain this a little bit because people don't understand this. I, I mention this all the time and people are confused by this because they're, they're used to a credit card at 16% or 17%. I say, you know, these big banks, their cost of capital is less than zero. Explain that. Well, in many cases, it depends on the timing. Right now, they're facing less than zero cost because they're getting subsidized capital injections from the governments and they can go and use these capital injections to, if you want, borrow from the central banks at cheaper rates. So as a result of it, we can take the Irish banking situation right now. The Irish banks in the last three months have received a sizable injection of capital in form of the government promissory notes and government bonds. What they did with those bonds is that they took those government bonds, they put them on their balance sheet, then they went to the repo window, to the repurchase window at the ECB, they put them as a collateral, borrowed from ECB at 1.5% interest rate, and then bought more government bonds in the markets. So as a result of that, in August, September, right after it was done on July 30th when the injection of capital went into the Irish banks, in August, September, the Irish banks, two Irish largest banks, bought m more than $3 billion worth of the government bonds of Ireland. And as a result of it, government, uh, government bonds, Irish government bonds, went up in price. The government turned around and immediately started presenting that as the case of stabilization, that its policies are working, that everything is coming handy and all the Would yields are declining on the bonds. And the whole Ponzi scheme continues rolling over, both in terms of the reputational knock-on effect on the government that it claims to be, and the banks pretending that they're healthy. And the government in return pretending that the banks are healthy because that helps them to pretend that they are themselves healthy. Isn't this a form of propaganda? Of course it is a form so of propaganda. So it's price propaganda. Now people Absolutely. associate propaganda with political propaganda, with scapegoating, you know, ethnic groups or religious groups, and uh, or propaganda in terms of jingoism and, and um, patriotism. But this is a different form of propaganda. It's a, it's a financial propaganda where if the government and the banks colluding together can create the illusion of an uptrend that then they can come out and say that things are getting quote unquote better but at the same time forcing through more draconian austerity measures. Right? European governments through the systems of corporatism that have existed here for decades. This is the governance mode in Europe of the economic policy and politics as well. Corporatism governance by consensus of interest groups. And How is banks, corporatism different than fascism? Because people say fascism, uh, classic connection between... I would be controversial uh, here, and you know, I always said that there is basically there is no difference until you come to the point of the differentiation of national dimension or nationalist dimension. The European corporatism today doesn't have the nationalist dimension. It is more benign, but economically, from an economic point of view, the system of organization is exactly identically the same. Ireland has been ruled for the last 20 years by social partnership. Social partnership includes government on one side of the table. On the other side of the table there are trade unions 
there are social pillar, what we call, in other words, environmental groups, the groups which are trying to combat poverty, and some of them actually have noble, if you want, objectives as well. And then on the other side, there is a big organization which unites all large businesses in this country called IBEC. And they sit down for years and sort out the entire economic pie, even though despite the fact that majority of them actually contribute very little to that economic pie, in most of the Irish economy is driven outside of that table, and it is decided outside of that table. It's decided by the exporters, it's decided by multinational corporations, it's decided by foreign investors who are never at that table. Let me ask you something. My drive into town from the airport on talk radio, they were saying openly that, well, there is a level of acceptance with this term that Ireland has lost their financial independence. And they're speaking about it in those terms as if, well, you know, as you know, we've lost our financial independence. Isn't that the same thing as losing your independence? It is exactly the same thing, because in today's terms, the economy and the financial structure of that economy, which underwrites it, is really what defines the sovereignty. Because we don't have army. We do not have wars, thank God, you know, and we don't have physical conflicts over the borders. The only conflicts we have are competitiveness conflicts. It, and the competitiveness in the end is determined by things like infrastructure, institutional infrastructure, human capital that exists in the country, the productive capacity of the economy in its totality, the productivity of that economy. That is precisely what we talk about, the economic independence here, the ability to influence those dimensions, those components of economic, you know, if you want economic being, that is the country itself. And they the say that itself. the Euro project was brought on to stop wars in Europe, but the now with the Euro and the institutions that have come with this crisis and the IMF and others coming in for foreign creditors, etc., there is in fact war going on. Uh, there hasn't there stopped war. It facilitated a new kind of war. There is. This week was very much clear po point whereby the European political project has fully decoupled from the democratic project. We should be very careful, by the way, when we're talking about Europe. Europe has two components today. It has a very sick component, the so-called Eurozone, the common currency component, which is really a mistake, very deeply seated mistake, because it was never based on the premise of the democratic institutions of checks and balances. And as a result of that, it became anti-democratic, as we have seen this week, and Europe at large. Europe at large is very beneficent and very productive institution, if you want, because it is an institution of free trade, free mobility of people, free mobility of capital. This is exactly what we want. This is exactly what we need. We need more of it. And all of the economies today are saying that economies outside of the Eurozone are saying exactly that. What we do not need is more integration, which is artificially grafted onto the foundations, which are so shaky democratically that the country cannot hold a referendum on something so fundamentally important, such as loss of its economic sovereignty, as we have seen in Greece. Konstantin Gergiev, that's all the time we have. Thanks so much for being on the Kaiser Report. Anytime. All right, that's going to do it for this edition of the Kaiser Report from Kilkenomics in Kilkenny, Ireland. I want to thank my guest, Konstantin Gergiev. You can find him on the web. It should be easy because he's a rock star of economics. Till next time, this is Max Kaiser saying bye, y'all.